And I have special guests for you. Danny Balancini and Freddie Carr. They're going to talk about military, VFW, and uh, welcome them to the stage. All right, great. Thank you. What I'm going to talk about is the origination of the, vet, the vet, Veterans of Foreign Wars. It started in 1899, 122 years ago. It started with three different people, James C. Putman on September 29, 1899 in Columbus, Ohio, and also by Irving Hale on December 1, 1899 in Denver, Colorado. Uh, the other one doesn't give his name, but he was from Pennsylvania. There was these three organizations until two thir or 2013, or yeah, 1913, when they had a convention in Denver, Colorado, and they formed the VFW as we know it today. Uh, the oldest VFW is in Denver, Colorado. It's uh, VFW number one. And I'll tell you about our great seal. The Cross of Malta is a VFW official emblem. The cross was relating to rays in the great seal of the United States together symbolizes characters, vows, purposes, distinguishing VFW as an order of warriors who have traveled far from home to defend several principles. Its eight points represent the beatitude described in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in the spirit, in the meek, <clears throat> the pure, the merciful, the peacemakers. Blessed are they who mourn, seek right righteousness, and, and are persecuted for righteousness' sake. The eight points of cross of Malta hark back to the Crusades launching during the uh, 12th century. Now, Danny will explain our VFW, the starting of our VFW here in Clyde. That was it. Thanks, Thanks yes. Brad. All right. The Clyde VFW was chartered in October of 1945, named after Harold Bud Hedman, who was the first individual from Clyde to pass away in World War II in the North African invasion. An interesting side note I found when reading an article written by Hugh Minor was that Bud, while in combat, could not divulge his whereabouts to his family. In a letter home, he asked what street his uncle Harold lived on, since he certainly would have known that his uncle lived on Glasgow Street. His family surmised that he was stationed in Glasgow or in nearby Scotland. The first VFW meeting was a held, held above a storefront. The first commander was Charlie Fishette. The first secretary treasurer was Tini Salarno. Since then, there have been 50 other commanders, including Fred and myself. The VFW hosts many events like wedding and baby showers, birthdays, wedding receptions, anniversaries, sorry to say, funerals, dollars for scholars, and our annual fish dinners, along with a few others. Our VFW donates to many charities such as the Blue Star Mothers to support sons and daughters who are in the service, Toys for Tots, and the Clyde Savannah Scholarship. We honor our veterans on Memorial Day by placing flags on veterans' grave sites and holding flag services at the cemeteries and in the park. On Veterans Day, we hold a flag service in the park where a large stone has 14 names listed that lost their lives during World War I, 13 men and one woman. The crosses in the park in front of the stone have 13 men who lost their lives during World War II and one from Vietnam and one for the unknown soldiers and one for the POW MIAs. pages don't turn as well as they should. <laughs> it's 
especially when you're shaking. The price of freedom for our country is very high. In the Revolutionary War, there were 4,435 casualties. World War, uh, the War of 1812, there were 2,260 casualties. We lost 116,516 in World War I. A whopping 405, 399,000 during World War II. The Korean War, we lost 36,574. Vietnam, we lost 58,220. Desert Storm, we only lost 383. And the Iraqi freedom, we lost 6,000. 775 lives. One more page. <laughs> it's not worth it. This bit doesn't even there go. In our post, there's a small table in our entryway to honor those who are POW at MIA. It is always set for a meal hoping they were turned. There are 16 cemeteries in the town of Gallup. Many Revolutionary War vets are buried in them and can be found with special markers such as the Dar, the Daughters of Revolution, and Stars. Though many lives were lost, many lives were changed forever. The VFW became and still is a place where veterans can meet, discuss related stories, and can relax among those who can relate to what they experienced. Now I would like to call Joe Solano and Steve Grote up here to talk about their father's experiences during World War II. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. July 13th, 1944. My father was a photo reconnaissance tail gunner in the uh, uh, B-35 Mitchell. He was in New Guinea, and they were on a regular flight, just coasting, and they happened to see an enemy boat down below them. They thought because of its size, it wouldn't be loaded with guns, so they said, well, let's strafe it. They flew down to strafe it and were shot out of the water. <laughs> so now they head out to sea, they're wounded, they are throwing everything they can out of the plane to gain weight, or lose weight, and keep the plane flying. They fly maybe eight miles, and then they crash land in the sea. They floated around for three days in a half-inflated raft, and uh, when the enemy would fly over, they'd have to jump in, up, out of the raft, turn the raft over, which was camouflaged, and hide under it. And my father had a broken nose, one guy had a broken arm, and uh, if you've ever seen one of these planes, climbing up into the plane is hard enough for any human being, I climbed up into one and looked down where my father would have been as a tail gunner. I wouldn't even have dared try to fit in there. I'd never get out. So here they are in the water, having to almost go underwater to get out of the plane. <clears throat> well, they floated around, and on the third day, um, a ship named, well, a flying ship named uh, uh, Mitch, I'm forgetting the name of the plane now, but it spotted them. And uh, they radioed in a Navy seaplane to pick them up. So they, the other planes hovered over while they, they picked up the, the guys out of the ocean. Over on that table is a um, large photo frame. 
And it's got a, it's a picture of the, uh, Mitch the Witch. It's got a picture of Mitch the Witch, was the, which was the plane that spotted my father. In the corner of that photo frame is a little painting of my father's plane. And the name of the plane was the Little Joe, and that's how I'm named for his plane that went down. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I was just, just thinking about it for a little bit. When I was 17, 18, 19, I'm just having a pretty good time. When my dad was 18, he was crash landing a plane in the ocean and floated around for three days. I'd say that took a lot of guts. Thank you. I'm a lot shorter, so I'll move this down. First of all, uh, I want to thank uh, all the men and women that were in their service. Uh, armed forces are, do we have, uh, how many veterans do we have here today? Raise your hand. Of any kind. Well, thank you for your service. I'm glad you're here today. I especially want to ask, are there any uh, Vietnam veterans here today? And I know there are. They've kind of taken over the operation of the uh, Clyde VFW. Um, we, uh, we do have one active Korean, and I'm not sure if we have any World War II. Yeah, we do. We a few, just a few, but I don't think they're here today. Footy Demont. Footy Demont. Oh, yeah, and uh, Footy Demont. Yeah, he's 93 or 4. He's still looking good. Um, on June 16, 1944, an aircraft B-17 heavy bomber took off from Kim Bolton, England. It had a nine-man crew. Um, it was reduced from a 10 to a nine-man crew on May 16th. And uh, now we're into 16 June, a month later. They're on their 30th and final mission. In that plane was a man called Russell Grode of Clyde. And he was a radio gunner, very... Um, Joe, was your father a radio gunner? What was it? Where'd Joe go? <laughs> anyway, tail gunner, I'm sorry. Radio gunner. And his position would open up a... Uh, a chute on top and, and fire out through the top. That's what a B-17 radio gunner does. Anyway, they're on their uh, final mission to uh, Lyon, France, uh, the bomb a marshalling yard, and after this um, mission, they would be done with their, their tour. And so they're on their way. It takes about five hours, four or five hours in the air, uh, and you're in a cabin that's not pressurized. You have um, heater, um, electric blanket type heater suits on because every every uh, thousand um, yard, uh, feet that you go up, it gets two thousand, gets two degrees colder. So at twenty five thousand feet, it's like fifty degrees below zero. So with that in mind, all of those uh, people that flew uh, had to put up with that, including the uh, uh, the uh, the Charlie Fischettes. The, uh, what was Charlie? An ace bomb pilot. And um, anyway, so um, on their mission, they were approaching the target. It was cloudy that day. The lead bombardier, there were 52 air aircraft in the air. The lead bombardiers missed the target and did what they call a 360. And the 360 is when you have to come back around. Well, the 52 aircraft in the air that day, the Ensign Mary was hit by flak and the right aileron was on fire. Pilot George McHugh ordered the bailout bell. Uh, they all went to their assigned spots to bail out. My father went to the bulkhead door along with a gentleman named Kelly Shaw. Kelly approached the door to bail out, turned around to my father and said, be my guest. And my father replied, no, you be my guest. He jumped, my father jumped, they never saw each other again. That was an account that came from um, Mr. Shaw back in 1998. Um, the, uh, a few of the, two of them were killed that day. The pilot and another um, gentleman were killed. Um, five of them were taken prisoner of war. A couple uh, were 
taken in by the French underground and uh, were saved a couple weeks later and got back. But I just wanted to say, following that, back in 2004, they have this, in, in uh, Pont Point, France, they have a, a monument every June 16th, the Memorial Day. And over there they have a monument very similar to our George Washington statue that depicts the American aviator George McHugh gave his life because he kept stayed in the aircraft and didn't let it crash into the village. He stayed with it and did a deep, uh, a steep dive trying to put the fire out. He went back up on a plateau very similar to our tank hill back there and the plane exploded 20 feet from the ground. Tom Morrow, my lifelong friend, and I got a chance to go to actually see the crash site. Uh, they have memorials uh, all over the little village of Palm Point, and in the village they have one of the props from the B-17, um, which has been there since uh, um, the plane crashed. My father was a POW along with a few others for 11 months, and Joe's father, Teeny, and my father were just a few of the many soldiers, men and women, that paid the sacrifice and some of the ultimate, ultimate sacrifice. And to that, I'm very thankful. So uh, I don't want to take any more time, but I thank you for allowing me to tell one or two small stories about our community. Thank you. And, and by the way, when my father was in prison camp, a week later, a guy from Clyde, Henry DeSanto, walked into the same prison camp and they spent eight months together. Almost forgot that. Thank you. <laughs> All right, one last note. I would uh, also like to mention Levi Donnelly, one of the most decorated soldiers in Clyde, earning a Purple Heart, a bronze arrowhead badge, which was awarded for being part of a combat glider attack, which is usually behind enemy lines. He was wounded in action on June 12, 1944, and received his honorable discharge on October 9, 1945, before returning to Clyde. On that note, I'd like to thank everybody for supporting our veterans.